Mutual Broadcasting System presents The Adventures of Father Brown. From the exciting pages of G.K. Chesterton comes the best love detective of them all, Father Brown, played by Carl Swenson. Now for tonight's adventures, The Mystified Mind. It is just after lunch on a hot August afternoon, and Father Brown sits at his desk in the study of his modest parish house. He's deep in his notebooks and monthly records. Father Brown doesn't look up at the sound of the doorbell. Nora, the housekeeper, comes along the corridor past the study door. It's a pity they can't leave him alone just for once. Hello, Nora. Oh, it's you, Flambo. Yes. Is Father Brown in? I brought someone to see him. This is Miss Harridge, Nora. Good afternoon, Nora. Flambo told me about you. <laughs> Nothing good, I warrant. Well, if you must see Father Brown, you must. He's in his study. Oh, thank you, Nora. This way, Miss Harris. You know, uh, Nora's bark is much worse than her bite. Hello, Father Brown. Well, well, Flambeau. My, this is a pleasure. I brought someone to see you, Father. This is Miss Joyce Harris. Well, come in, come in, my dear. Come in. Uh, pull up that comfortable chair for Miss Harris, Flambeau. I'm afraid we're disturbing you, Father. One of man's greatest pleasures is to be disturbed at his work. <laughs> there, sit down, my dear. Thank you, Father. Miss Harridge has brought me a case, Father, which I think is more up your alley than mine. Oh. The fact is, we're on our way now to talk to a murderer in his cell. Oh. And what makes you think, Miss Harridge, that this man you call a murderer is not guilty? Why, how do you know I think that, Father? Well, because Flambeau is a detective. And the only use a man charged with murder has for a detective is to prove his innocence. Well, you've hit the nail on the head, Father. But I'm afraid there isn't much I can do. It looks like an open and shut case. You know, I I have never understood the meaning of that phrase, Flambeau. To to be both open and shut is a paradox. Well, uh, now suppose, my dear, that you tell me about the man in the cell whom someone has called a murderer. Well, to begin with, Father, trail engineers. Rollins' offices are located on the 17th floor of the Jefferson Building. The whole thing happened last Thursday morning, just after I arrived at the office. I see. Well, go on. Well, every Thursday morning, just as our office opens, a man comes in to clean the window. I see. His name is Luigi Conti. We've all gotten to know him well over the years because his daughter was in Keller. I just got into the office last week. Good morning, Miss Harris. You know, I've sent you not to come to work. Good morning, Lisa. Good morning, Mr. Clayton. Hello, darling. Oh, just think what it would be like at the beach today. <laughs> I guess the big grandmother gag has worn itself out. <laughs> Let's plan the beach for the weekend, though, huh? Oh, yes, I'd love it. Oh, good morning, Mr. Gregory. Uh, good morning. Whether it's good or not is a matter of your own personal feeling. Uh, if you're waiting to get into the vault, it's only three. The time lock won't work for another two minutes. <laughs> When I first came to work here, I was convinced, though, it wasn't until I began getting here on time that I discovered he actually lived in the outside world. <laughs> uh -oh. Well, I want to talk to you about the Kennedy job after I've gone through the mail, Clayton. Yes, sir. Oh, there's the window cleaner. You know it's gotten so you can tell time by Luigi. <laughs> hey, Joyce, yes. You know, that's a job I wouldn't like to have. What? Luigi's. That's something to the pit of my stomach when I see him climb out on that. He's used to it. There's really no danger with one of those safety belts. The window cleaner! He's falling! It's Luigi! One side of his belt, gay boy! Just hanging there! Mr. Rowley, I'll help him! Mr. Rowley! Quick, Gregory! <laughs> falling all the way to the street. Papa! Papa! Don't look, Lisa. You mustn't look, my dear. Dreadful, dreadful accident. Accident? Look, part of the belt's still hanging there. It's been cut through. Not an accident. Tony did it. Tony? Now, you mustn't say that. Tony did it, I tell you. I know it. Tony did it. The whole crux of the case, Father. Oh, 
It was murder, all right, because Luigi's safety belt had been cut through with a razor blade. All right. So that the minute he threw his weight against it, it gave way. And then the man that uh, Lisa accused, and the man she called Tony. That's Anthony Cremona, Father. Uh-huh. And he's been arrested and charged with a murder. He was Luigi's assistant at the Jefferson building. And it was nuts about Luigi's daughter. Well, why did the girl jump so quickly to the conclusion that it was this boy who had cut the case? You said? Well, apparently because the old man and the boy were constantly arguing and fighting. Ah. There were threats and counter threats. I see. Father, Luigi was terribly proud of Lisa. Every cent he'd earned had gone for her education and business school. Mm. He thought Tony wasn't good enough for her. He was dead set against anything serious developing between them. Their window cleaning equipment in a closet, and both Tony and Luigi had a key to it. Young Tony had plenty of opportunity to slice the belt with a razor blade. As mm. far as the cops are concerned, that's all there is to it. Yeah. But is that all the evidence against him, Flambeau? That's all the police have found, Father. No, no, that's just it's too black and white. There, there are no shading, no coloring. People are not so simple as a first grade problem in arithmetic, you know. Well, Father, I've gotten to know Tony a little in the last year. Oh? He's been so anxious to marry Lisa. He's been working like a Trojan to better himself. Going to night school, studying engineering. Father, Miss Harridge has an interesting point to make. Oh. Well, it's simply this, Father Brown. If Tony had struck down Lisa's father in the midst of one of their arguments, it would fit his character, his hot temper. Yes, but cutting through the belt was a cold and thick character, is that it? Yes, Father. Let's see. I think we should not put off going to see Anthony Cremona in this cell. No, but the trouble is he won't see anyone. He won't talk to a lawyer, he won't see Miss Harridge, and he won't see me. We thought that maybe with you, he might feel differently. Well, sometimes... Injustice will turn a man's face away from all other men. We can only try, Miss Harris. We can only try. Come on, a cell at the end of this block, Father. Oh, thank you, thank you, sir. Uh, Flambeau, would you and Miss Harris wait here? Yes, Father Brown. Someone to see you, Cremona. I don't want to see anybody. I, uh, Tony, I didn't know they sent a priest to see you. It'll just be for the hanging. But there are two kinds of hanging, Tony. The hanging that takes place in the minds of men and the hanging that takes place at the end of a rope. A priest may be valuable in both cases. Well, I can't stop you from talking to me if you want to. Hey, you may open the cell door for me, Sergeant. Call her when you want to get out, Father. All right, thank you. Now, look, if this is some kind of a trick to get me to change my story... Since I haven't heard your story, Tony, why should I ask you to change it? Well, maybe it don't sound like much. Can't change the truth. And who is it that doesn't believe you? The police? Lisa? You know something, Father? The minute it happened, the very minute it happened, Lisa shouted out my name. Yes, but you had threatened your father, hadn't you, Tony? Sure, I threatened him. He was a stubborn, narrow-minded old fool. But I had a suit of clothes and a fine tailor and plenty of dough in my pocket. He'd have thought I was the right guy. Yes, Tony? Father, Lisa hasn't even been to see me. She hasn't given me a chance. You think she'd at least hear my side of it, wouldn't you? Well, what is your side of it, my son? I never touched Luigi's safety belt. Kept that stuff in the same closet, but I never touched this belt. Uh, yeah, go on, Tony. If I was going to murder Luigi, I wouldn't have been satisfied with cutting just one side of his belt. No? No. But the belt should have held him up. Even when one side gave way. It was an accident the other side of the belt didn't hold. No window cleaner would have cut just one side of the belt if he wanted Luigi to fall. What's the use of my telling him that? Maybe a great deal of use, Tony. You see, there's a bitterness in your heart that's keeping a cloud in front of your eyes. You have friends, you know. Friends? Oh, well, it's Miss Harris who believes them. Miss Lambeau, the detective hired to clear you this charge. And there's me, Tony. Do you mean that, Father? Yes. Do you really mean it? What's the first thing? Well, then... If you see Lisa, will you tell her? Well, 
Will you tell her there are still people that don't go around accusing a man without giving him a hearing? Well, Father, would he talk to you? Yes, 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 Lambeau, he talked with me. And what do you think, Father? Sometimes the things I think are frightening, even to me. Sometimes I wish I could give up the whole business of thinking. Then you think Tony is guilty? No, Miss Patterson, I think he's innocent. But in that case, Father... I... But thinking it isn't proven. Now, I'd like to go to your office. I'd like to see the place where this accident happened. Accident? Now, Father, I've seen these tricks pulled before, and cutting a safety belt is... I have a passion for accuracy, Mr. Ball. I call it an accident because it was an accident. Tragic accident. You see, the window cleaner, Luigi, was never meant to die. But, Father... Now, let's not waste time, Flambeau. I, I have an urgent curiosity to lay eyes on a criminal, and he's not in a cell at the city jail. And it's entirely possible that we'll find him at the office of Rollins and Keller. May God have mercy. <laughs> And this is the office where it happened, eh, Miss Haddad? Yes, Father. There's only this one large drafting room and Mr. Rollins' private office. I see. And that, that's the vault that you spoke of. Yes, it is. Oh. Old Gregory sits there by the wicket, and nobody goes in or out of the vault without being checked by him. Oh, what's so valuable in the vault? Oh, chiefly blueprints. We do a lot of work for the government. All very hush-hush. Now, which is the window from which Luigi fell? Oh, uh, that one over there, at the far end of the office. Ah, yes, it would be at the far end. And, Miss Harridge, I think I should talk to your employer, Mr. Rollins. Very well, Father. His office is right over here. Thank you. Pardon me, Mr. Rollins. What? Oh, come in. Mr. Rollins, this is Father Brown and Flambeau. They'd like to talk to you for a moment. Come in, come in. Well, if you'll excuse me, I'll get back to my drawing table. Yes, Miss Harris. Well, gentlemen, what can I do for you? So we've come about the window cleaner who was murdered. On the contrary, Mr. Rollins. We've come about the vault that was robbed. Well, gentlemen, make up your mind. I'm sorry to have to tell you that Valuable designs or blueprints are missing from your vault. Well, I don't know what this is all about, gentlemen, but I can assure you there's nothing missing from the vault. You see, it works on a time mechanism. It opens at five minutes past nine in the morning and closes at five minutes to five at night. All day long, Gregory sits outside the gate and nothing can be taken without his knowing it. I trust Gregory with anything I have. With your money, Mr. Rollins? With more than that, Father Brown. There are secrets in that vault that money could not buy back. Well, I only hope that whatever was stolen is still missing. Oh, really, Father. First you tell me I've been robbed, and then you wish me bad luck on top of it. Now, if I worked in your office, and someone offered me a great deal of money for one of the blueprints in your vault, this is what I do. I take the blueprint, have it photosynthesized, and then return it to the vault. And if I was lucky enough to get back in time, you'd never know you'd been betrayed, Mr. Rollins. That would be a way to do it. Father, Look in the vault, right. Mr. Rollins. Don't let anyone know what you're looking for. And if you find anything missing, come back and tell me, but no one else. This is really ridiculous. Look, Mr. Rollins. All right. I will look. Will you gentlemen wait here? Now, thank you. Of course, I'm really an innocent bystander, but uh, if it wouldn't be too much trouble to explain... Yeah, but the trouble doesn't lie in the explanation, Stanford. The trouble lies in catching a peculiarly subtle thief. Murderer. Th that's the point, Flambeau. There was no murderer. By intent. And uh, how was Luigi supposed to fall 17 stories to the street without dying, Father? He wasn't supposed to fall. The other side of his belt should have held him up. But what could be the purpose in it? The everlasting greed of man, Flambeau. That was the motive. The purpose in cutting Luigi's belt was purely and simply to distract attention from the vault. 
That's, that's, that's an old magician's trick. Distract attention from what's really happening. Everyone was at the window. Yeah, my George, it would work. Certainly. If the thief knew exactly where the blueprint he wanted was kept in the vault, it would only take him a matter of seconds. Precisely, Flambeau. And with everyone's attention riveted in another direction... You were right, Father Brown. Secret designs for a new jet-propelled plane, gone. You must notify the police at once. Uh, not if you want the plans back. What? If the thief doesn't know that you've discovered the theft, he'll try to put them back. But how do we catch him, Father? If we watch the vault, he won't go in. And if we don't watch the vault, we won't know who puts the plans back. I think I can find an answer to that, little. How? By committing a crime, Flambeau. What, what are you doing here, Father Brown? Oh, I'm just sitting on this bench, Miss Harridge. I saw Flambeau leave, but well, why are you sitting here? Well, you, you see, to understand why a criminal acts as he does, one must know exactly how he feels. One must, uh, so to speak, get inside of him, understand his every thought. And when I've done this, when, I, when I've reached the point of committing the crime myself, then I know who the criminal is. Oh, well, that sounds complicated. Understanding the human mind is the most complicated of all sciences, Miss Harridge. Now, take yourself, for example. You're interested in young Tony Cremona. Is it? Just ordinary human kindness? Or is it personal and intimate? It's just that he's a nice boy who's being blamed for something I don't think he did. I see. And uh, is there no one else here who feels the same as you? I know Jim Clayton. I'd, uh, I'd like to talk to this Mr. Clayton of yours, may I? Yes, I'll call him. Jim? Jim? Yes? Jim... This is Father Brown. Oh, hello, Father. How do you do? Uh, Joyce has been telling me that you feel the same way as we do about Tony Cremona. Well, unfortunately, just feeling something will not help him. Yes, I know. The trouble is, there aren't any clues that point in any other direction. Ah, that's, that's what makes it such a clever crime. But just because a man points in a certain direction, Mr. Clayton, doesn't mean that we must walk in that direction. So I am stubbornly walking in all the other directions. If you see what I mean. Here's a telegram for you, Father Brown. But the telegram? Well, now, that's odd. It's very odd. <clears throat> Advise you leave office of Rollins and Keller... And don't come back. Well, well, well. Father Brown. Uh, yes? I'm Lisa Conti. I know why you're here. Oh, do you now? Because I don't know why you're here, Lisa. I work here. What else should I be? Well, you might be in a cell at the city jail talking to a nice young man who's eating out his heart because of you. Talking to a murderer, you mean? And where is your authority for judging, Lisa? Even a court of law will listen to young Tony's story. He threatened to kill Papa. He did it. I hang him. I'll stand and watch it and be glad. Then you should be happy now, Lisa. Because you've already done the only hanging that will cause him any pain. But, Father Brown, I tell you... A person who will not listen even to a lie cannot have much to tell anyone, Lisa. Because what can she know? That this either true or false. Tell me, who, who, who delivered this telegram? Oh, it was delivered by a regular messenger, Father. I see. Here, read it. What? It's a threat against you, Father Brown. Do you think the police allowed Tony to send me that telegram from his cell in the city jail? No. They I... tell me, Lisa, that it's possible to visit the jail at any time, day or night. I beg your pardon, but uh, you're Mr. Gregory, aren't you? Uh, yes. Uh, do you know the mechanism of that vault fascinates me? It, it, it's closed for the night now? Yes. I see. Uh, you, you mean to say that no one can open it until morning? Not till five minutes past nine tomorrow morning. 
Tomorrow morning. You certain? There's no way on earth to open it till then. Well, now, you, you may think it's odd for me to have this turn of mind, Mr. Gregory, but suppose a thief were to walk into the vault in broad daylight and come out with something he had no right to have. I'd stop him. Oh, but suppose he was a monstrous big man, Mr. Gregory, who could pick you up and put you aside like a child. Then I'd shoot him. You see, I keep a gun in this desk drawer. Oh, my. Yes. Well, now, now, suppose that you weren't at your post, Mr. Gregory. I'm always at my post. Always? Always. Well, well, well. That's an interesting speculation, Mr. Gregory. Good night. Yes. I'll, I'll see you in the morning, just before you open your wonderful vault. You're coming back again tomorrow? Oh, yes. Unless, of course, I should receive a visit from a murderer before that time. <laughs> There you are, Father. I thought you were never going to get home. It's the Grand Flambeau. I've been warned to give up my innocent bench sitting at Rollins and Keller. Here, here you can see for yourself. Oh, so that's the way the wind blows. Well, at any rate, it's a wind, Flambeau, but I'm, I'm frank to say that I don't know from what direction it blows. Oh, excuse me, Flambeau. Of course. Father Brown speaking. Okay, then listen. Uh, uh, who is this? Never mind who it is. The boy won't hang if you mind your own business. What? You, well, what's that? You got the telegram? Yes, yes, I got it. Did you send it? Never mind who sent it. It's good advice. Now, you stay away from Rollins and Keller, you understand? Stay away. Hello? 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 Well, now, we seem to be getting warm, Flambeau. Then that was another warning to stay away from Rollins and Keller. Oh, what are you going to do? Return, of course, tomorrow. But, Father, the thief won't put the plans back while you're watching the vault. He'll put them back tomorrow morning, Flambeau. Well, what makes you think so? That's not a matter of thinking. I know it. And I know when, Flambeau. He'll put the plans back in the vault at exactly ten minutes past nine. <laughs> Please. Seventeen, please. Well, what's the matter, Father? You look worried. Now yeah, we've drawn this a uh, touch fine, Flambeau. It's already one minute past nine. Well, unless the elevator breaks down. Don't, we... don't, don't, don't even think such a thought, Flambeau. <laughs> don't, don't even think. Seventeen. Ah, well, we made it. Oh, Father Brown. Oh, good morning, Lisa. Father, I... I went to see Tony last night. Did you now? Father, I don't know what I could have been thinking of when I talked to him, when I saw him. He's a good boy, Lisa. A good, honest boy who holds you very high in his heart. And I'm, I'm sure there's less pain in it now from having seen you. Three minutes past nine, Father. Oh, yes, yes. Ex excuse me, Lisa. Come along, Flambeau. Good morning, Father Brown. Yeah, good morning, Miss Harris. Good morning, Mr. Clay. Hello, Father. I hope to be here in time to see the vault mechanism. <laughs> well, you've hit it right on the nose, Father. There's Gregory standing by now. Eh, yeah, I see you did come back. Yes, I came back, Mr. Gregory. Well, now, how, how does this vault of yours work? In 30 seconds, I open the door. You, you, you mean to say there's no ringing of bells? No fanfare of trumpets? No. I just open the door. Like this. Well, now, Mr. Gregory, I am disappointed. You know, somehow I, I, I expected more drama. Here comes Mr. Rollins, Father. Oh, uh, good morning, Mr. Rollins. Father Brown, I simply can't hold off going to the police any longer. I have a responsibility to the government. Those plans... Are... Those plans, Mr. Rollins, will be in your hands in a very few minutes. You know who took them? Oh, you might say that I do. Uh, well, what time is it, Flambeau? Uh, seven minutes past nine, Father. Well, then there's no use delaying. Uh, Flambeau, <clears throat> uh, please take those very efficient handcuffs from your pocket and put them on 
Mr. Gregory. Me? Gregory? Why, that's yeah. impossible. Arrest Mr. Gregory, Flambeau. Well, it's your party, Father. All right, Gregory, hold out your hand. Well, this is insane. I, I tell you, you're all insane. I had nothing to do with that window cleaner's death. You're charged with stealing important plans from the vault, Gregory. That's not true. You know that's not true, don't you, Mr. Rollins? Plans have been stolen from the vault, Gregory, but I think this is a mistake. I can't believe that you had anything to do with it. I backed Gregory to the limit, too. Nothing could be taken from the vault without Gregory's connivance. He says he never left his post here. No. Well, if he didn't, then he's a thief. Come along, Mr. Gregory. Oh, really, Father Brown? Gregory's been with us 30 years. There's no doubt about it. Gregory's on the level. Well, maybe he is. Maybe he is. Father Brown, just a copy, my copy. Father Brown, what are you doing here in the vault? Waiting, Miss Harris. Waiting for you to bring back the plan. So you knew? Well, uh, How did you know? Well, I didn't. Not really. But... All I knew was that the thief would come into the vault. You see, Miss Harris, you fell for your own trick. Trick? The window cleaner was your trick for distracting attention from the vault. Mr. Gregory was my trick for doing the same. So that was it. I confess that when you walked in here, I was a little puzzled. After the telegram and the man's voice on the telephone warning me not to come back here. Man's voice? Yes, I, uh, I rather think that your fiancé, Mr. Clayton, has suspected all along that you were guilty. Oh. And he tried to frighten me off. Why did you do it, Miss Harry? Jim and I wanted to get married. He said he didn't have enough money. Then I was... Offered a big sum to steal one of the blueprints for just a few hours, just long enough for it to be photostatic. Then I could put it back and no one would be the wiser. I see. But everything went wrong. First Luigi was killed. Oh, Father, I swear I never meant that to happen. Yes, but it did happen. And then when Tony was arrested, you went to Flambeau. I wish I knew why. I wish I knew why I went to Flambeau in the first place. Because no person is all bad or all good. You knew that Tony was innocent, and the goodness in you forced you to do something to help him. The strange twist that you must now forfeit your freedom, perhaps your life, only because you were not all bad. <laughs> oh, help me, Father. Please help me. Yes. Yes, I'll help you. But we must begin by facing the music. Come along, Miss Harridge. <laughs> Next week, The Prophecy of Doom, an exciting adventure in which a world-famous mind reader prophesies the death of a famous inventor at a moment to be decided by a watch that cannot tell time. The Adventures of Father Brown, based on the stories by G.K. Chesterton, was produced by Francis Sherling Oliver and directed by William M. Sweet. Carl Swenson was Father Brown. And the cast included Barry Thompson, Mitzi Gould, Bobby Reddick, Bill Griffiths, Will Gear, Gretchen Davidson, Vinton Hayworth, and Gladys Thornton. The script was by Judson Phillips, and the music by Bill Wurgis. John Stanley speaking. Americans everywhere, please listen, and seafaring men especially. Experienced seamen are now needed to man cargo and... Waters. This means you, if you're an oiler, water tender, mate, or engineer. Every available man of the sea is needed to keep every fighting man at the front well supplied. Join the Merchant Marine as soon as possible, upgrading as faster than ever before. Why, your name, address, and classification today collect to Merchant Marine, Washington, D.C. Standby pay begins immediately upon acceptance. This announcement from the Warshipping Administration is brought to you as a public service. This is the Mutual Broadcasting System.